We're going to finish up Chapter 6 by learning to name covalently bonded compounds. The covalent bond forms when you have a sharing of electrons between two nuclei rather than a transfer of electrons. So let's look at the formation of the covalent bond by using the simple atom hydrogen. As two hydrogen atoms approach each other, they still want to have that full outer orbital of two electrons like the noble gas helium. But instead of pulling the electron from one hydrogen atom into the orbital of the other, like this, the other hydrogen atom is not willing to let that electron go. Unlike a metal atom that by losing its electron becomes stable, the hydrogen atom is not going to become stable by losing its electron. So it's not going to let the hydrogen atom adjacent to it remove its electron. So how are they going to form a bond? Well, each hydrogen atom wants not only its electron, but the electron in the adjacent atom. So as they approach each other, they try to steal each other's electrons. And by doing that, they pull themselves closer together until they reach an optimal distance where each atom believes that it has full custody of those two electrons in its outer orbital and has that helium electron configuration. So this hydrogen atom believes both electrons belong to it. This hydrogen atom believes both electrons belong to it. And that perfect optimal distance where the orbitals overlap and electrons are shared is the covalent bond. That covalent bond is represented with a line which represents the bond excuse me, between the two hydrogen atoms. The properties of molecular compounds are very different from the properties of ionic compounds. You now are talking about two nonmetal atoms bonding. These are separate molecules. They do not create those crystal lattice structures. These compounds have very low melting points compared with ionic compounds, and they are usually liquids, gases, or very soft solids with low melting points. The ionic bond, as you recall, is between metal and nonmetal atoms that form ions as they transfer their electrons. The covalent bond now forms between two nonmetals by a sharing of electrons, or actually a fighting for the electrons between the two atoms that pull their nuclei together. In both types of bonding, the atoms want to achieve an arrangement of electrons like the noble gases. They just do this by different methods. They're still creating a stable compound. Those nonmetal orbitals arrange those electrons so that each atom thinks it has a noble gas arrangement of electrons. The only type of molecular formulas or covalent formulas that you will learn to write at this point are binary. So you have two nonmetal atoms. All binary formulas up to this point have ended in ide, and that is no different. All binary molecular compounds are also going to end in ide. When we were writing ionic compounds, we would write the metal first. When you're writing a covalent or molecular compound, the most metallic nonmetal element, that is the element that is furthest to the left, is written first. So you would write NO2 and not O2N. And then 
all binary compounds are ending in IDE as usual. When we write ionic compounds, to figure out the ratio of those ions, we use the charges to determine the number of atoms in the formula. Your molecular compound's name is going to tell you the number of atoms, and you're going to use prefixes in order to write the formula. So you're going to have to memorize these prefixes. Here's a list of those prefixes that you will need to know. Mono meaning one, two is di, three is tri, four, tetra, and then penta, hexa, hepta, octa, nona, and deca. To name a molecular compound, the prefix that you will use is going to indicate the number of atoms in the first element. So 2 is di. You're going to say di nitrogen. You never changed the ending on the name of the metal atom in an ionic compound, and you will not change the ending of the name of the nonmetal that is written first. So it is di nitrogen. 5, the prefix is penta, so dinitrogen, penta oxide. You, again, must change the ending of that nonmetal atom. Dinitrogen, pentoxide. Typically, chemists will drop the vowel on the end of the prefix. Instead of saying pentaoxide, they say pentoxide but that's sort of a picky point. For this compound, you have one carbon atom at the beginning, so you would think you would say monocarbon, but when the first element has only one, we drop the mono. So it simply becomes carbon the four is tetra chloride. So the compound's name is carbon tetra chloride. You only drop the mono on the first element. If you are going to write the formula from the name, it's quite simple. Sulfur means one. Trioxide means three oxygens. The formula becomes SO3, sulfur trioxide. Again, remember, all binary molecular compounds and in IDE, all, both covalent and ionic. If there's only one of the first element, you do not put mono. So you're going to say <coughs> monoxide, not monoxide, if you're bringing two vowels together, or tetroxide instead of tetraoxide. But it still remains pentachloride and triiodide. So all the rules are not followed. In reality, the endings are taken off if they think it sounds better. You should take some time to practice naming these compounds. And you should take some time to write the formulas for these. There are no more difficult formulas at all in the covalent formula compounds. So if you can write and name these, you should be in good shape. There are two compounds that are covalently bonded that are never called dihydrogen monoxide or nitrogen trihydride. 
and those compounds are water and ammonia. They are always called by their common names.